Uh, please, people on the back, come, come closer. Uh, we have a lot of exciting stuff to talk about, I guess. Lukas, you know, many people, mm -hmm. luckily, after Delivery Hero IPO, now know this small German startup worth uh, six, well, o almost seven billion euros. And you as uh, the founder or one of the founders of that. But I think interesting would be to learn what else have you done in Germany and elsewhere in Europe in the tech industry. OK. <coughs> so first of all, thank you. And hello, everybody. It's great to be here. It's really cool light. You know? And <coughs> so w what did I do? I started a company selling t-shirts in Germany called Spreadshirt. Some of you might know it. In Germany, it's pretty known. Some of you might know it here. So basically an e-commerce company, it's still around, still doing well. And um, then I've been yeah, part of like helping to build the German or like European tech ecosystem. So started venture capital firms, uh, started a tech magazine called Gründerszene in Germany, um, invested in many companies, have been a very active angel that like, I think like around 100 angel uh, investments and also started a few e-commerce companies. Yeah, so, one of, of those, you know, the Team Europe, I can probably call it company builder. Uh, you know, apart from designing the uh, own flag for European Union that I heard Team Europe have did, <laughs> I mean, there were also a lot of the companies that you have started there. And I wonder, I mean, this company building uh, business model, right? It went through its ups and downs. Uh, you know, some people are, you know, pissed off. Some people like it. What is your current thinking? Would you advise entrepreneurs to team up with uh, company builders? <clears throat> yeah, so first of all, like talking about Deliver Hero again, yeah? So Deliver Hero, one of the founding stories of Deliver Hero, and there are many founding stories in Deliver Hero, partially because of its roll up, yeah? So yeah. one of the strengths of Deliver Hero is like to teaming up with entrepreneurs in local markets and and, and uh, growing the whole um, thing together. So like there are many entrepreneurs and many founders in Deliver Hero, and this is part of its success. And one of those founding stories actually is the story of, of Team Europe, where we like, had a Berlin-based so-called company builder, yeah, where we, we set ourselves the goals. We want to build two companies every year, so like serial entrepreneurship, two companies every year, and each of them um, had to have the clear ambition and the clear prospect to become worth 100 million, two to three years after we started it, yeah? so that the project sizes are, um, are large enough. And actually, one of those companies that we started that way was, uh, was Lieferheld, was the yep. German version of, uh, of Delivery Hero. And um, the fact that we, do this in, that we did this within this incubator, this company builder, enabled us to be very fast and very agile when it came to internationalization. So imagine you start your successful startup, it's ramping up, numbers are looking good in Germany, um, <clears throat> but it's still very competitive, so you have to fight your market, you have to be focused. And, and, and in such a situation, if in the, within the first year, it would be very hard to say like, okay, now we go international. Yeah, would you, risk, you would risk of being distracted and not focused, and then neither win Germany nor be successfully international. So, but as Team Europe, as the company builder, we've been able to follow up very quickly with the international version of it, which actually was Delivery Hero, which we started together with Niklas. And um, yeah, and, and that, way, that way we sort of had best of both worlds. Yeah? So this is an example where a company builder was um, very successful, and we have been able to play our strengths. Having said that, Today, I would be more cautious about company builders, specifically if they're not um, focused vertically. Yeah? If, you go, if you go too broad, I mean, like in the last year, and, and this is one example here, Slash, the tech scene has grown so much, like yeah. it got so much, so much bigger. So <clears throat> because of one of the major disadvantages of a company builder is you, you per definition, a little bit defocused. You know? And uh, so I would only advise it if, the, if something is vertically focused. In Berlin, uh, Jan Beckers, the Hitfox Group, Hitfox, Heartbeat Labs, Finleap, I think. They, they, they FinTech Focus Incubator, they do, yeah. Yeah, they, they have vertically focused incubators. And this is, um, this is, this is a good approach. So I would recommend, with, 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 with those, I would recommend to look at it, yeah, as potential founders, as entrepreneurs or managers. 
Interesting. to team up and, with those. And maybe diving into a delivery hero story for a second, I mean, clearly, you know, Nordic market was something where the company was very strong. When we have invested, I mean, many years ago, it was still quite early company. I mean, me, we, I mean, Target Global, I mean, the pitch of the guys was like, look at our amazing metrics in the Nordics. We're going to make the same thing in the other, you know, 20 countries of our operations. And that, you know, largely, largely was true. But I think when uh, you are looking at the startups, you know, in the Nordic region, uh, you are sort of thinking whether the unit economics, other parameters are so good because of the, you know, specifics and the rich customer base, or it is genuinely something very relevant that can be expanded across Europe. What would be your advice for the founders operating in these markets and observing all those interesting uh, economic parameters? You mean if the, if the Nordics are different than other parts? Yeah, whether they can safely expand to Germany, your home turf, and other countries in Europe. I think this is really a case by, this is, this is really a case, by case uh, um, uh, thing. Yeah? So hard to say. I mean, like the, the important point here is like that, that uh, it was very safe to invest because if you see those international arbitrage, you see the future in other markets, and then you have, on a case by case, you have to compare. I mean, with Delivery Hero, for example, we're in the Middle East, we're in Latin America, and some of them are very different, and, and, some, and some of them we learned also lessons the hard way, let's say. For example, China is really hard. Yeah. <laughs> that's interesting, I mean, on, on, on China, that's the, the market where Delivery Hero has, has to pull out. What would you say, I mean, would you still advise any of your companies to expand there? Well, in, into China. Into and China? And so, how? I think to, together with the joint venture, like, like this local thing, and it has to be super focused. You have to do it with, with very strong people there, like team up in a joint venture. And, and, and we, we have not been able to, to do that, like given the many things that we did simultaneously. So, so at some point, you have, to, you have to pick your battles. But I think the, the, the interesting point is here, like also one or one other interesting point is when you look at um, starting large businesses, from Europe, it's like you, you have to be global, sort of. If you want really to, to play in the top Champions League of the, of the tech world, you either have to be American, you have to be US, or you have to be Chinese. So, so America is like an order of magnitude more than what we have here. China is probably times three uh, uh, to that. Uh, and for uh -huh. us to be able to play, we have to be, we, we have to be pretty global. Yeah? So like Delivery Hero is... Middle East, Latin America, some Asia, and Europe. Yeah, I mean, and for that, and you know, for China specifically, we have to raise a lot of capital. And you know, Delivery Hero have raised, I mean, over, well, over a billion for sure, even, even more actually. I wonder if any of the stories from early days of the company you can share with, with the crowd. I heard that you were taking the personal loan from the bank initially to fund the business. Or oh, it's all rumors. <coughs> um. It's, it, it wasn't a personal, personal loan. Yeah? I, I, basically, we had to come up with some financing very quickly. So it's one of those stories where, where an investor lets you down a little bit. Yeah? So we had like a financing commitment from one of our investors. He said, like, if you do this acquisition, we will give you the money. Then we prepared this acquisition, did this acquisition, which was pretty big for us back then. I had everything ready. And, and we, we signed the acquisition papers before having the money. Yeah? Uh -huh. And then he would let us down with the financing. He said, like, he changed his mind because of whatever, like, something unrelated to us. And, um, and so we had to come up with, uh, with a significant amount. Back then, for us, significant amount was, like, I think, 23 million or something. That's um, within, within very significant 20 amount. 20 days. Yeah. yeah. So I started calling, uh, calling my friends and asking for loans, yeah, for short-term loans. And what I did, like, and I also gave all the money that I had, on my accounts and then uh, the short-term loans to make them very safe, I secured it with all the other assets that I had. So it was like sort of like a no-brainer for the people to participate in this very swift, uh, very swift financing. You know, amazing. I mean, a lot of, a lot of conviction. And um, I wonder, I mean, these days, beyond Delivery Hero, uh, you have a lot of conviction in the new industries like these flying cars, a volocopter that uh, you are doing. Maybe you can tell everyone a bit, a bit more about that and your other recent passions? I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So <coughs> what can I say about flying cars? Flying is much cooler than driving. Yeah? I did my pilot license last year. And then you fly above the city of Berlin, and it's super fast. And then, and then you go back to the airport, and then you, you, you feel when you go back to the city. And even though I have no traffic there, it's beautiful in Berlin, no traffic lights, you feel like you're crawling. Yeah? You feel again like, like a little bit like being warm. Yeah? So like flying is like dignity to some extent. The problem with that and why nobody likes flying so much, like in small planes, we call it personal aviation. It's either very dangerous or you need to go to the airport or when it's a helicopter. Helicopters solve the problem by brute force, I, I say. Like, yeah, helicopter is really like a violent thing. And with the new technologies that we have now, basically multi-copters, like, like people say drones, it's not really drones because a drone would be unmanned by definition. But those multi-copters are much more, much more elegant. Yeah? So like, they're relatively quiet. They're super easy to fly com compared to a helicopter. Basically, the computer flies it for you. Yeah, it's much quieter. I, I used to say 10 times quieter. It's not really correct that it's 10 times quieter, but it's maybe as loud as a bus, mm -hmm. not as loud as a, as a helicopter. And um, yeah, super easy to operate and super cheap. Yeah, it's cheap to maintain and cheap to buy. So it will be like, it's not like a luxury product anymore. It will be like uh, uh, for everybody. Yeah, and then, uh, this is the first time that I do something with hardware regulated, so it takes much, 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 much longer than to launch like some app. I mean, like at Team Europe, we used to like start a product within three months. Yeah, the minimum viable product is live. Here we talk like at least three years before you can have a minimum viable product. Yeah, and before it gets mass market, you need probably 10 years. But then it's going to be really, really cool. Yeah, so. Let's actually play the game. You know, assuming we are slash 2027 right now, and you are getting out of the door to the city of Helsinki. I mean, what, what do you see there? Like, what are the flying cars, you know, the robots on the streets? Describe first, it to us, first I, your I, vision. I go out, and then first I see darkness. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I, I, it's. It will, be, it will be a little bit buzzing. I mean, when you, when you look at the modern skyline today, Shanghai or whatever, I've been a couple of weeks ago, I've been to Shanghai. So I picked this as an example. It, it feels pretty empty. I mean, something is missing almost like within this, within this skyline. Yeah? So it's, it's going to be buzzing a little bit. Um, but before it's buzzing a lot, it's, I don't know, like 20, 30 years probably. Um, yeah, let's. What about, the, what about the delivery? I mean, all the foodoras and deliveroos of this world, I mean, the business we know, we know well. Would it be robots doing it, it instead? I mean, it has to be super safe and it has to be quiet. But yes, there will be delivery drones. Yeah? There will be delivery drones. They might be, as, I, don't, I don't know, like the, the advantage of those products are so high, like both like for personal aviation as well as for drone delivery, be it on the ground or through the air. Those products are so... so the advantage is so high that like the regulation will follow because of it's just so useful. And we see some of the early applications uh, um, today, and let's see when it's when it's going to take off. And as an entrepreneur, I'm very excited about this this whole new field. Yeah, there's like a whole ecosystem around it. Like you can think landing rights, air traffic control, sense and avoid, and it's yeah. But in terms of the building the company, I mean, what are the opportunities you would advise you know people to consider? I'm sure if you would be certain about one opportunity, you would be already building it yourself, but maybe some of them you are not yet certain and considering. So like, I'm not sure what I should build, but I should advise other people what to build? Yeah, I mean, that's why they invite you here to speak uh, on stage, you know? Just get in touch with me if you're, if you're interested <laughs> in this field and let's, uh, let's discuss. No, so I'm personally like, sort of still learning, still evaluating, it's, it's, it's fascinating, yeah? So, what, but what I just said, like sense and avoid is one, air traffic control is one, there will be landing rights, there will be uh, software, software around it, like guidance software. I mean, yeah, specific approaches to sense and avoid. I, I backed one, did a small co-investment in a company in Silicon Valley called Skydio. They, they, they take an approach where they really put a lot of computers onto a drone, so they're really fast, a lot of computing power up there and, and can do AI-ish sense and avoid in real time. But right. what, would, what would you say, like, with, where should we as 
Target Global, which I'm also part of. I was, I was about to ask you, I mean, uh, not you know, to make any advertisements there, but uh, you have, you know, we had a privilege of you joining you know, uh, our firm in you know, Berlin and also European wide to invest. And I, I wonder, I mean, whether you, as a founder, would advise you know, other people doing the same thing, uh, you know, because you are investing as an angel otherwise as well. What is the benefit, really, of uh, sort of investing professionally? The benefits of investing professionally, I have to think hard about that. <laughs> <laughs> Only downsides, isn't it? No, I mean, like, obviously, you have uh, 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 much many more resources and the, the investment is much more diligent. So at some point, with some ticket sizes, you have to do it. You have to be professional. Yeah, also, given that, like, the, the development of the whole scene in the last years. Yeah? So, like, to do, like, all the nitty-gritty work the, and the operations, plus the other advantages of being within a platform, being able to compare notes, and last but not least, also having the financial firepower. Uh, some of the some of the deals that we say is like uh, that we see. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I say like a strong capitalization sometimes can be a self-fulfilling prophecy for success. I mean, this is also like part of the delivery hero story. Was that like who, yeah, once it was clear that this is a a, a strong model and, and and all of that, it comes down to like who's who has the better fundraising and who is faster with fundraising. And also for us, as, as Europeans, we want to play the global game with the US, so with the US, with, with, with China. It's about like having strong capitalization, so. so. Yeah, no, maybe to sort of answer your previous question, I think if you just look at the things we have done, you know, both together and, uh, you know, at, at Target recently, a lot of insurance, a lot of small business, uh, you know, focused companies, and of course, you know, everything related to mobility and, you know, the robots and that, that, that kind of things, you know, probably we should be doing some of the blockchain and cryptocurrencies, but we did only some. Again, I... We should also do CRISPR, augmented reality, everything that's super new, right? On I the other hand, we have to pick our battles, and, and the same that goes for the company builders goes for, for, for venture capital. Either you have some USP, like you're super big, or you're really the biggest, I don't know, you're the vision fund or whatever, and this is your USP, um, um, or like going vertical is a good idea, and like focus on one, or like a, or, or on a few, but then really be an expert in those. Maybe a couple of questions, you know, to wrap up the discussion. As a founder, as a young founder, how would you stand out from the crowd? You know, 20,000 people at Slush. What would you do? How do you stand out as a young founder? Unlimited possibilities. Um, I don't know. You could jump on stage now. That would be standing out. But ideally, you have something, some good product, uh, uh, something exciting to show, uh, to demo. Okay, fair enough. Why is good, you know, to be in Europe these days and start a startup here rather than somewhere else? Why is good to start a startup in Berlin, for instance, where where is your home turf? I think combination of like talented talent and um, and affordable talent, and there's still less competition than compared to 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 some places in the world like the Silicon um, uh, Silicon Valley, yeah? and also the advantages like. I think the, the really strong startups, they have something unique. I don't know, like I'm looking now more at this, in this technology space. So they will come from some Fraunhofer Institute, Max Planck Institute, so like adjacent to the research institutes. And, and this is something that you cannot copy. Yeah, so I see like more, yeah, more teaming up with, with those people who come really from product, like engineering, and then those like, let's call it like career entrepreneurs mm -hmm. who, who want to embark on this career. And here, I also hear that, like, the, that the, the, the Europe and our ecosystem is upping the game. That means that like, when like 10 years ago, the brightest financial or business-minded people wanted to go to investment banking or consulting, yeah. today entrepreneurship... Not that popular anymore. Entrepreneurship is more often the top choice. So right. that's great. And uh, this is why we're all here. And we celebrate entrepreneurship and technology and the future because of... One important thing to know is the future. The future is the future. All right. Voila. <laughs> Let's clap the hands for entrepreneurship and Lukas and the future, huh? Guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, man.